I am going to have my slab subducting and I'll put creep on the bottom of the slab. I'll put creep at depth on the subducting, subduction interface and then I'll put earthquakes on the shallow portion of the subduction interface as well as the splay fault. Um, so boundary conditions and materials, same as step three. If I go back to step three, boundary conditions. So uh, I want the slab to be able to move independent of the mantle underneath because I'm gonna I'm gonna use the fault to actually pull the slab down <laughs> I'm via prescribing creep. And so I want I want that slab to be able to move away from the boundary. So I'm going to when Charles created those node sets, he said, uh, you know, use an, make a just make a node set of say the x negative boundary, but then remove any points on the slab. And so that's the um, I'm, that's the node set that I'm going to use in this simulation, so to allow the slab to move um, over the mantle. Um, so I still have five displacement boundary conditions, but now the node sets that are being used where I have an overlap between the boundary and the slab is going to be different than it was in step two. Um, uh, materials are exactly the same. Uh, earthquake cycle, so I'm gonna put creep on the deep portion of the slab interface, creep on the bottom of the slab. I'm gonna put an earthquake at 100 years and 200 years on the subduction interface. And at 150 years, I'm gonna put an earthquake on the splay fault. Um, so how many faults do we need? We need three. We need the top of the slab, the bottom of the slab, and the splay fault. How many earthquake sources do we need? For the splay fault, we have one. We're just gonna have one earthquake source. For the bottom of the slab, we have just one. That's the creep. For the top of the slab, we actually have three. We have the creep that's depth dependent uh, on the deeper portion, as well as the two earthquake sources. So quickly looking at step zero four, whoops. So again, progress monitor, this time I'm gonna do 300 years and I'll do a time step of 10 years, the same, this scholastic model, do you wanna do a fraction of the Maxwell time? Here I'm changing the uh, overriding the node sets being used in my PyLeth app file. So I'm gonna do boundary X negative without the slab, Y positive and Y negative without the slab. Um, my fault, three interfaces now, slab top, slab bottom, and the splay faults. All three have prescribed slip uh, boundary conditions. Uh, I need to separate my so the fault, for each fault, I have different set of cohesive cells that are identified one set of cohesive cells for each fault. Just because they are a cell that's within my domain, even though there's zero volume, they need to be identified in the same way that they have an ID that's like a material. Um, this does not correspond to the node set, but it must be an ID that is unique across all materials and all faults. So generally, the default value is 100. Now that I have multiple faults, I can't use the default for every single fault. So I'll do one fault at 100, one fault at 101, one fault at 102. Um, you can start whatever value you want, but by starting at 100, to me, that indicates I'm using a fault. Um, I never expect to have over 100 materials in my model, um, so I know that I have good separation and no overlap between IDs between my materials. Um, and uh, the faults. So slab top, again, node set for the entire fault, uh, node set of that bottom edge that's buried. Again, quadrature information. Here are my earthquake sources for the um, top of the slab. Zero, I'll put uh, the origin time for my creep. So here's my earthquake sources. Remember I said I had three earthquake sources. So I'm gonna call them creep, EQ1 and EQ2. Perhaps a better name would have been creep EQ100 and EQ200. Um, the origin time for the creep, I'm gonna start the creep at a time of zero, start the origin time for earthquake one at 100 years minus epsilon, earthquake two, 200 years minus epsilon. Uh, my creep slip time function is gonna be a constant slip rate time function. 
Um, here's my creep earthquake source. I'll use a simple grid database. Um, spatial DB, it's a fault slab top creep. And so basically I put a depth dependence of the creep in there. So it should use a linear interpolation slip initiation time. So remember within my step time function, I can specify the time as well as the amplitude. I've already specified the origin time for the entire fault. Um, so this is a time relative to that origin time. Since the origin time was actually the time I wanted to start slipping, I use a zero value here for the slip initiation time uh, relative to the origin time. Earthquake one, uh, slip distribution uh, is given in uh, a simple grid co-seismic. Um, I don't remember what spatial distribution is in there. Um, I think it's just depth dependent. Uh, for slip initiation time, again, I want zero relative to the origin time. Earthquake two has the same parameters as earthquake one. Um, output, normal direction, strike direction, dip direction. My slab bottom ID of 101, remember I had ID of 100 for my first one. So this now I do one greater than that. Uh, slab top, slab bottom is the node set, slab bottom edge for the bottom edge. Now then uh, the bottom of my slab becomes horizontal as it gets farther to the west. In order to be able to determine the tangential shear directions um, in an ambiguous fashion, we generally take the cross product of the normal direction and the uh, zero, zero, 001 direction. Now when my slab is horizontal, the normal direction and the, uh, the up direction of zero, zero, 001 are collinear, so the cross product is zero. Um, so I don't know how to, it becomes ambiguous what my fault orientation is. So what I did here is I know that uh, most of the time for, that the up direction is fine for when I have a dipping part of the bottom of the slab, but then as I come up, I need a little bit of off vertical direction. And so what I did is I gave it a, a minus 0 0.1, 0, 0 0.9. Now this, is generally a unit vector, but it doesn't have to be precisely unit vector because all I'm wor worried about is uh, the direction that the cross product is giving. So um, this allows me to, to, to uh, establish sort of an along strike and up dip directions on my slab, even when it's horizontal, that'll be consistent with the same direction as it gets a dip and uh, curves down below the uh, trench. Um, Again, bottom of the slab, I want constant uniform slip rate, so a constant rate slip function. Here's my slip rate, so on the bottom of the slab, uh, left lateral plus two, reverse slip minus four centimeters per year. Um, those are the directions. Here I have an error in my uh, file here. I said 150 years, actually I put in 250 years minus epsilon. Um, splay fault, I'm gonna give uniform slip so here I specify my right lateral slip and reverse slip, um, and then the output. Um, and, and one thing I wanna point out is that the relative motion on the top and bottom of the, of the slabs are opposite. So on the bottom of the slab, uh, where is it? Uh, I have, uh, let's see, it's play fault, that's, Bottom of the slab, my reverse slip is minus four, meaning it'll be, it's actually a normal sense because my slab is going down. And then on the top of the slab, I'll have a reverse sense to also have uh, everything above the slab going up and the slab going down. Um, uh, okay, so let's run. And here I wanna point out that those aren't the, as we went through the .cfg file, there were more files that had actually um, got an exit pair view here. And from the PDF, it didn't carry over the underscores. So here I'll give it, send it to an output, a log file. So this is the way I would normally do it. And then spit out, give me constant updates of the output. 
Any questions regarding setting up multiple earthquake sources, repeated ruptures on the same fault? So if you wanted to specify a heterogeneous So I'll show you what the spatial data is fault slab top. Uh, what did I do? Slab top creep. So this is this has a spatial variation in the creep rate. So I'm gonna in the shallow above minus 45 above minus 45 kilometers elevation. I'm going to have a creep rate of zero. So it's going to be locked above 45 kilometers. Between 45 and 60, it'll increase linearly up to minus two centimeters per year in the sort of left lateral direction, up to four meters per year in the, in the reverse direction. And then down, I gave it minus 999. Our maximum depth is 400. Um, it'll be uniform. So here I have a spatial variation in the slip. If I want spatial variation in say the time the slip occurs within a rupture, then instead of my, uh, within a rupture, if I want a spatial variation slip initiation time, instead of a uniform database here, I will put a, whatever spatial database is appropriate to have that linear time dependence. If I wanna have a rise time that's not just a step function, we have several mostly seismic suitable slip time functions. There's uh, the Archuleta Lu cosine slip time function. We have the Brune source time function um, that they have a, basically a rise time parameter as well as the initiation time parameter. And we're cranking away through our time steps. Any other question? So that's when, so here we're prescribing when the earthquakes happen and the slip on the fault. Tomorrow morning we'll, co we'll go over a spontaneous rupture where we specify uh, the friction on the fault and then based on the deformation, when it overcomes the friction, the fault will slide. So that's, sort of, that's why we, that's what the spontaneous and spontaneous rupture refers to the fact that we're not prescribing when the earthquake occurs, it spontaneously happens based on the physics also called dynamic ruptures. So spatial database. So here I gave it a depth dependence that was 1D. I can use a 2D spatial database to give either a, a long strike and depth dependence. I can give the projection, the horizontal projection of the slip. I can stick in points along a, the slab if I want to actually give it in terms of that coordinates. So the spatial database will take whatever points that Pyleth needs the data from and project it into the coordinate system of the spatial database. That's why we need compatible coordinate systems. Um, but you don't have to, if my fault is in three dimensions, as long as I can project to that coordinate system, in this case, I've just done depth. Um, it'll fit, it, it will do that interpolation for me. Um, the step, step six, um, has a spatial variation and slip that's generated by a Python script that uses a Gaussian slip distribution and geographic coordinates. So it's, it's using a different coordinate system um, than what the mesh is given in. Still cranking away. Other questions? Yes. Yep. No, uh, good, good question. Um, so let me show you. So you can do something like this. So dash dash nodes, it automatically will launch the MPI job on four, on this case, it's four cores. Um, and uh, it'll partition the mesh, redistribute the mesh, um, and run. Generally, you can, on most desktop machines, it's, these problems are memory band limited. So it's sort of however many memory buses you have, things will scale well up to there, and then they will saturate. <laughs> uh, 
Um, right, Gen generally Trellis operates in serial. There, I know the latest version of Qubit has some tools to generate in parallel. I have never used them. Um, that's the main reason why we have uniform global refinement within Pilot is that we will generate our mesh up to several millions of cells in serial and export it and then have Pilot refined by a factor of two or four to generate a higher resolution mesh and run on, you know, tens to hundreds of cores. That's how we get to higher resolution. In Pilot version three, we will have higher order discretizations that you can even generate at a coarser resolution and have more basis functions and sort of a higher uh, order a polynomial within your cell to find the displacement uh, variation so that you can actually don't have to generate as high a resolution mesh to get the same uh, uh, as fine of mesh in your mesh generation to get the same resolution in your actual numerical solution. It, the refinement works in on uh, triangles, quads, uh, tets and hexes. Um, as you re refine the tetrahedra, um, they will get slightly more distorted. So you have to be careful about uh, how dis you want the very best quality mesh you can get if you're going to use refinement. Same thing with hexes. We use unstructured hexes. So even if you have a distorted hex, um, it'll get slightly more distorted depending on its uh, shape. Oh, I finished. Okay, so I need to edit my uh, viz file. And once we look at the viz file, then we'll end this session. So plot uh, displacement warp. <coughs> so now we're up to step four. So I change the sim name. Step four. So run my dis uh, Python script again. And I'll show you how to, an easy way to generate these Python scripts. So first I'm going to, I'm gonna skip, so ah, I'll skip to the end, get the, whoops, reset my color scale. Um, whoops, nope, that, that's actually right. I just have, a, there's a lot of deformation going on. Um, I have X displacement, so you can see how my slab has moved. Now I'll rewind things, turn off the original mesh, um, and play. So there's my subducting slab. There was earthquake one, earthquake two, and there's the splay fault. Um, so you see, because my sort of slab is just ramming into the mantle, when I deform <laughs> the mesh by a factor of 10,000, you can see it's just being rammed right into the mantle. Um, you'll notice that here with my free surface boundary condition out here, um, the I'm imposing the creep, it's driving the slab down. Um, and let's see, so here I move forward, you can see creep down here, this fault up there part is locked. Then once I, let's see, at 100 years, I get the earthquake, it catches all the way up. I have prescribed that amount of, that amount of catch up to perfectly balance um, within the, the slip distribution. It keeps going, catches up at 200 years, then at 250 years, there it pops up the splay fault. Um, so if you want, a tip for generating the uh, Python preview script 
If you do tools Python shell, oops, that's not what I wanted. That's, uh, so if I start trace, then it'll in a, uh, if I do things um, like say I change this to Y displacement, let's turn the domain back off and then I stop the trace again, it shows me the Python code that uh, would be consistent with changing those things. Now it's very verbose um, and you don't need, you, the, it takes a little bit of understanding a pair of you to know which of these commands to pull out. Um, if you pull out all of them, it'll do exactly what you said, but you, can, you don't need all of these to have it actually do what I did on the GUI interface. And you'll notice that um, if, you, if you try and replicate what I've done in the plot displacement warp uh, Python function, you will not uh, Python script. You'll notice that pair of you would spit out, you know, probably two to three times as much information. I have sort of extracted just the most important variations and parameters that uh, are required to make it reproduce what I saw on the screen. Um, but this, if you do repeat it, find yourself keep doing the same things over and over again in pair of you. Um, this is a great way to sort of put those in a self-contained file that you can exactly replicate. If you're generating figures for a paper or a presentation um, using Paraview, rather than trying to sort of save, save the state of the simulation or you know, that method for sort of saving how you create that figure, use the Python script. You can actually, and these scripts I set up so that I can create, like it would dump it out to an image so I can exactly replicate things um, for you say in our pilot manual using these scripts without having to you know, do a lot of manipulation of the GUI interface. So it's a great way to sort of, in the same way we have journal files to remember how we did everything in Qubit or Trellis, we, it's a nice way to use the Python scripts in pair of you um, for this. Um, this is something we've added this year to this example suite. Um, so you won't find them in the other examples except for the 2D subduction zone, which we'll talk about tomorrow with fault friction.